Hello, everyone. My name is Jacob Kyle. I'm the director of Embodied Philosophy, and I want to thank you very much for tuning into this five-part panel series that we're calling The Future of the Yoga Teacher. Before we start the panel, I'd just like to say a few words about Embodied Philosophy and the work that we do for those of you who are new to our work. Embodied Philosophy is an online community and educational platform for Eastern philosophies and practices. We publish a range of content. We have our podcast called Chit Heads, in which I interview leaders, scholars, and teachers from the Eastern philosophy community. We present online courses, conferences, and seminars, all of which you can learn about on our website at embodiedphilosophy.com. We have two courses that are launching next month, one on the philosophy and iconography of yoginis, the Hindu yoginis, and one on Tibetan Buddhism. And we are also relaunching all of our writings as a monthly online journal called Tarka, which officially launches next Friday with our new website. We also have a private Facebook group for our community called Embodied Philosophy Forearm. Forum. We have a weekly e-zine that has uh, been recently envisioned and will also launch next Friday along with our new website. So there are many ways that uh, you can learn with us and get involved. So if any of that piques your interest, uh, please check out our website, embodiedphilosophy.com. Next week, we have a talk happening that's a part of our Yoga Teacher Advanced Studies Seminar, which may be of interest to you. Next Thursday, July 19th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Issa Guchardi will be giving a talk called Depth Hypnosis, Perspectives on Trauma for Yoga Teachers. Uh, you have to be a student of the seminar in order to tune into that talk. So if you're interested in this talk or the seminar in general, go to embodiedphilosophy.com forward slash yoga seminar. Actually, I think I forgot to set up that link. So it will be embodiedphilosophy.org <laughs> forward slash P forward slash Y-T-A-S-S. Again, that's embodiedphilosophy.org <laughs> forward slash P forward slash Y-T-A-S-S. Okay, so let's get into why you're all here. So this uh, panel series, which is again called Future of the Yoga Teacher, it's a five-part panel series, and the mission behind this for us is really that these conversations will highlight five different ways that yoga teachers are taking their teaching practice beyond the fitness studio model and into domains of expertise and specialization that are changing lives both individually and collectively. Our hope is that these conversations will inspire existing and future yoga teachers to think outside of the 200 hour TT box and take action to use their teaching as a tool of transformation on a variety of levels and, and from a variety of different angles. And that's sort of what this panel is about, is, is, is exploring those different angles and intersections. So please, those of you who are with us here live, I encourage all of you to ask any questions that you have in the comments, and I will moderate those questions for Anika and Margarita, my guests today, uh, towards the end of our session, okay? So this week we are looking at activism and what it means to be both a yoga teacher and an activist. With me live here today to explore this topic are Onika Mays and Margarita Tosado. So now I'm gonna bring up my fancy image of them that I made today. Here you see mm -hmm. their beautiful headshots. Um, so I'll introduce <laughs> Onika first. Onika is an LMT and an ERYT200 with certifications in trauma conscious yoga, therapeutic yoga, yoga for cancer, and is a loving kindness meditation teacher. As a therapeutic massage therapist, Onika embraces the idea of meeting people where they are and combines mindful movement as well as meditation to create spaces for self-empowerment and healing. As the training director of Liberation Prison Yoga, she co-facilitates training for teachers interested in serving those impacted by incarceration. She spent several years teaching at Rikers Island and now teaches at the Manhattan Detention Complex. Before working in wellness, Onika was a passionate retail leader and uses those skills as well as her commitment to healing as the director of operations for Transformation Yoga Project, a nonprofit that brings mindfulness to people in recovery and are impacted by the justice system. Ever grateful for all that she's doing, Onika bows deeply to her teachers and students. Margarita Tosado is an ERYT 500 <laughs> yoga instructor, having received her 200 hours certification in vinyasa yoga from Leah Kramer at Prana Mandir, and her 300 hour certification in yoga and Ayurveda from Summer Kwashi and Lee Evans of Yoga Sukhavati. 
Further training includes Insight Yoga with Sarah Powers, Yin Yoga with Bip, Biff Mitofer. <laughs> Hope I pronounced that correctly. Anatomy of Breath Center <laughs> Yoga with Leslie Kamenoff and Embodied Anatomy and Kinesiology with Amy Matthews. Margarita has been studying the effects of yoga on trauma and trauma on yoga since 2012 and trained in yoga for incarcerated youth with the Lineage Project and trauma-sensitive yoga for PTSD with David Emerson of the Trauma Center, as well as Annika Lucas, who I interviewed for the Chitheads podcast, by the way, of <laughs> Liberation Prison Yoga. She has been teaching with LPY in New York City jails and independently at Odyssey House, a residential program for drug addiction and recovery. As a longtime dancer, as well as yogini, Margarita believes in an explorative practice to awaken embodiment, find our patterns, and see the potential that lies beyond them. In her classes, whether in yoga studios or city jails, you can expect a combination of movement, breath, spiritual philosophy, stillness, humor, and passion to encourage each individual to make a home in their own body-mind. So with that, I would like to welcome uh, Margarita and Onika. Hello, Margarita and Onika. How are you? Hey, how are you? I'm fine. <laughs> so excited to be here tonight. I'm very so it's a real pleasure to chat with you. We were, um, on, we've been on this uh, call together for the last 30 minutes before we started, and we were having a range of technical difficulties that um, <laughs> we're happy to have ironed out. So hopefully um, uh, none of that will perk up so much uh, during our conversation. But if it does, you know, that's the nature of live video, and we'll, we'll make do. So, um, so before we get into a conversation about, you know, I want to talk about the work that you do that I that we um, that was mentioned in the bio, this fantastic work that both of you are doing. Um, but I want to talk very generally about activism, and mm -hmm. since this is about the intersection of yoga and activism, let's just start with a really very basic question, which is, you know. I, I feel like many people today think of activism as, you know, being angry on Facebook or showing up to an annual protest, and they call that their activism. So I'm wondering what activism is to you from each of your perspectives, and do you want to start, Onika? Yeah, sure. Um, I think activism is taking a stand um, about something that you're passionate about, whether it's social justice whether it's being body positive, whether it's embracing that the community that you're in, but that you are, you're vocal about it and that you're vocal about the issues that come up. You are vocal about the, um, the passion that you have for whatever, for, whatever, for whatever moves you and helps you move through the world. And when that, that passion or that community becomes impacted by oppression um, or by some other system, that you aren't, aren't sitting around. And that may not mean running out in the street, as you mentioned, or showing up to a protest, but it's finding a focused, directed way to tell the world around you how you feel about that and showing up in your own power. Mm, mm, beautifully said. What about for you, Margarita? <laughs> beautifully said. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I think that activism for me has a lot to do with doing what we can with the tools that we have to make things better for others mm -hmm. rather than just ourselves. Um, I have a past as an activist in more, you know, street protests and squatting houses and all of those things back where I was born. And it just, it's not really for me anymore. And I really missed the this aspect of life that allowed me to use the tools that I had and the resources and the privilege that I have to impact other people and um, just had to find some different ways you know I think that the when we as we accumulate resources in our lives if we keep the resources for ourselves um, is just a form of greed and a form of activism yeah. would be to share those resources yeah. with the other people out there mm. So, you know, I, uh, one of the things that I've, I've always wondered, and I feel like there's kind of a range of perspectives on this, is the idea of yoga, you know, which is, you know, um, uh, the idea of yoga being a form of activism. And I'm, I'm wondering what you think about that in, in 
um, to you? Like, is yoga constitutively a form of activism, or does 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 something does yoga require something supplemental to make it uh, make it um, align with active the activist impulse? Uh, what about you, Margaret? Do you want to start? <laughs> I I kind of do. <laughs> so <laughs> I did not do that for any of those reasons, only because I thought I'd toss it up. <laughs> so um, it is a it's a it's a very large question, and in the end, like I've been thinking about it a lot, um, and we talk about it a lot every week when we see each other. But I don't think that yoga itself is by nature an activist thing. Also. Partially because yoga itself is so many things that it is really hard to actually define. And I think that it is important that we trace our choices and our practices and whatever it is that we're doing now, that we can trace them back to where they, can, to where they come from. And we see what kind of baggage we might, bring in, we might be bringing in into our practices. And I don't think that yoga at large is a form of activism. Mm. Um, Commercial yoga has become, if if anything, the opposite. It's a right. manifestation of capitalism. It's a manifestation of uh, elitism and ableism and so on and so forth. But there are also plenty of stories and histories about yogis that set out to do yoga in response and protest to corrupt um, societies and religious systems and so on and so forth. And... I think if we trace it back to that, then, or if we look into those traditions, then they, they feel a little bit more familiar to me and a little bit closer to me in terms of um, what my intention is. And then there is the larger fact of living in a society that is incredibly disconnected from the body and for people, women, people of color, in particular minorities, um, very physically oppressed mm -hmm. and any practice that can allow you to make a happier home in your body to me is a form of activism because it also goes against those forms of oppression mm -hmm. but i do think that it needs to be a very conscious choice right right onika do you agree with that do you agree with yeah, the idea of yoga I, being an activism yeah i too like took a this is like a really big question that um i was thinking about and i was brought back to a training that I participated in with Transformation Yoga Project in Philly where um, someone brought up this whole idea of trauma and form yoga as, um, you know, it's almost in some ways it's appropriated, right? Because we, when we do trauma yoga, we don't necessarily use Sanskrit and sometimes actively don't use Sanskrit. So there's this disconnection from lineage. And so that is the opposite of activism and it's colonialism right when you right. take something and you take the parts that you think are really good and then you're bringing it somewhere you're you're um you're diluting it and turning it into something else um but to margarita's point um if we're talking about yoga um for the sake of this conversation in the west that has typically been practiced by a certain segment of of society and a, a privileged elite section of society, when you take that and place it in an environment that it's not, and I put this in quotes, supposed to be in, that does become, I think, a form of activism, when you give access to something that traditionally people didn't have access to. So by that I mean when you give classes um, for free to people who need practices around breathing and compassion and movement to feel at home in their bodies when we're talking about people of color and people in the trans community who do not even have agency over their own bodies, when you talk about practices like yoga, it becomes activism. But by and large, I, you know, I do agree that it's yoga as, as, a, you know, as a thing, um, I don't necessarily see it as activism. I think I've made conscious choices um, with how I, I present yoga um, when I when I do work, particularly um, inside a jail, that I do think of it as a form of activism, um, but also as a form of embodiment and a gift for people to take back themselves. Mm, mm, yeah. So you know, one of the things you said, Margarita, I, I really liked, which is you know, I, I I like the emphasis, or at least highlighting the fact that you know, yoga historically was kind of a um, a transgressive practice that one could say, you know, you said you saw, saw some 
uh, that felt familiar to you because you know these yogis were sort of in a sense um, um, pushing back against the status quo in some way, and now we're in this you know cultural context in which yoga has become completely um, you know immersed in the in the consumer culture and 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 then this uh, this idea that you're mentioning about people having the 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 relationship to their bodies and I feel like and this is I'm trying to segue into this conversation about the principles of yoga and mm -hmm. how they are amenable to an activist mindset because you know you could highlight or you could look at the those aspects of yoga philosophy or yoga principles which seem to imply a kind of up and out right like a, mm -hmm. a transcending the body for the divine but there's also um there's also um uh aspects of the tradition that say quite the opposite that actually you know embodying mm -hmm. the divine or being experiencing a kind of a more expansive or new sense of your own embodiment is a form of liberation so do you want to talk a little bit about that you know maybe the the principles of the practice that seem again amenable to this sort of um, to this activist work that you do, and then maybe maybe also touching on on some principles that seem to be in contrast or in conflict with that kind of um, objective. Who wants to start? <laughs> um, I I think the idea of sati or truth is something that I think a lot about when it comes to yoga, um, and this idea of of what does truth mean. Um, this work that, that I do with, with people who are incarcerated, and particularly brown and black people, and people who are, who are poor, um, that truth of, of who someone is gets really distorted by narratives that are, are pressed down on them from, from the lack of access that they have to health care, or um, being physically oppressed, or even killed by um, people who are supposed to be there to protect them. Um, so what, what people believe to be true about themselves becomes distorted. Um, and, and there's this disconnection with who, what does it mean to be me? What does it mean to feel good inside my body? Um, and I, I think when I discovered yoga, I found a deeper connection to myself. And while I wasn't necessarily looking for transcendence to something divine, um, the idea that I could feel at home and my body in a world that actively rejected me um, really spoke to a new idea of what it means to be truthful to myself about how I move through the world and then and and how I share that truth with the world and it's constantly growing and changing and I find that the more that I tap into the idea of truth and what it means to honestly show up for myself um, I show up differently for the people that I serve and just people that I talk to because I am able to actively reject truths that are that are also told that are supposed to be true um, yeah right right like not um, what's the what's the famous buzz term right now I, you're I was thinking like fake news <laughs> right right <laughs> right fake news are these sort fake of like news. socially constructed truths that aren't, aren't right. actually true yeah and so. yeah and it's and it's 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 one thing to hear like that fake news, and it's another thing to be poor and brown in a community where your your sense of truth is so pressed down, mm -hmm. and the, having this heavy oppression that you're not even sure what is true. And fake news isn't even something that you can necessarily identify with because your idea of survival is just so day to day that yeah. there there becomes this sense of just having to be here right now and not a way that is mindful, but a way that's sort of like in that lizard brain. And it's very, it becomes very reactive um, and becomes very, you know, violent in some ways to the self and then to people around you. So being able to get inside yourself and find an idea of truth that is settling and peaceful um, and, and loving um, and compassionate, it allows you to move a little bit differently. So, um, yeah. Mm, excellent. So, Margarita, on that same kind of question, do you do, are there any kind of principles or teachings that you know stand out to you as being something that we should really focus on when we're thinking about the relationship between yoga and activism? I think that I mean the tr truth is a big is a big thing, right? Like Onika was rightfully saying, and I I think that there are some very, very interesting resources in, in a lot of 
the yoga philosophy that we study about uh, peeling off the layers of conditioning mm -hmm. mm. um, and about really looking with discipline and without judgment, looking into oneself and one's own life and one's own context and situation and peeling off the kind of the meaning that we impose on things that's not necessarily uh, useful meaning, but that might be just kind of societal or familiar or, or you know, trauma effects or whatever, whatever it might be. And digging a little bit deeper than that to, th to see what the, what the actual meaning of things and life and ourselves mm -hmm. is. Mm. And I think that there is a lot to be learned from that, from a philosophical perspective. And even from a physical perspective, this whole argument about or, or conversation about figuring out patterns and undoing patterns and noticing what happens in the body and becoming stronger in terms of self-support and self-sustenance and or sustenance um, all of that stuff is really really important um, and it seems like it, it might seem um, not very logical I guess in some ways but we've noticed working particularly with women in prisons or jails and survivors that working out and having a really active practice and becoming really strong in your body and being able to do things that you never thought were possible just physically it might seem something very silly and very irrelevant for somebody that doesn't have that kind of trauma or that kind of disconnection and that kind of non-ownership of their bodies but it's actually really 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 important for people that are in that kind of condition and situation hmm. so the yeah the the patterns and the mm -hmm. self-study. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's that's what really and really relevant. Yeah. I'm sure there is more, but oh, yeah, you know. No, but that's a really good point. So, you know, um, I feel like we've sort of already started to talk about this a little bit um, in previous things that we were discussing and that you were saying. But <coughs> I wanted to ask more, kind of directly, when you think the practice of yoga actually alienates us from uh, sociopolitical <laughs> awareness <laughs> and action, you know, when does, you know, and, and we, we're not okay, talking okay. about like yoga objectively, but yeah. maybe we can say yeah, the yeah. modern postural practice, when right, does it yeah. become uh, a hindrance or an obstacle to what we're talking yeah. about? Yeah, I've got two words for you. Spiritual bypassing. Oh, yeah. that's exactly what I'm to yes. You know. Okay. Tell us what that means now, Margarita. I'm gonna drop the mic and leave now. That's it. That's it. Uh -huh. So it's not just spiritual bypassing, but it's a lot of things that are con I see connected to them, like the magical thinking idea and law, law of attraction, like all of those things that are oh have made gosh. their ways into. <laughs> I know what you think about it because I follow shit heads religiously. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> um, spiritual bypassing, and we see it happening, and I think there is a place for that to some extent. I think that when people are in a really, really, really dark place, mm. it is helpful to, um, in order to give a meaning to what somebody's experiencing, it is helpful to be like, okay, this is what God wants, or this is what my karma is. I'm just going to deal with this. I'm going to deal with what is coming and you know just try to get through the other side right yeah. and there is a incredible value to that right because there are things that we just cannot unpack and we mm -hmm. might not be able to um survive if mm -hmm. we weren't able to give it at least that little bit of meaning right mm -hmm. um but when we take it into a larger context and taking it back to what onika was saying the fact that modern postural yoga or yoga at large in the united states particularly is being practiced by affluent white people yeah. Let's say 90%, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that when you take that kind of uh, mentality to an extreme, it means that you are using spiritual excuses to not face what you need to face. It also tends to have a strong smell of victim blaming, yeah. right? It's, uh, it's, which is very problematic, right? Um, and I think that's that's a huge problem. That mm -hmm. is a huge problem. And the this habit that we have of superimposing a, a spiritual or mystical meaning on physical prowess, 
which is just to me ridiculous. Oh yeah, and then like, I'm just idea. gonna say Instagram. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like the idea, and you know, the idea. I love this idea that like you know your the flexibility of your body is parallel or <laughs> or somehow analogous to the flexibility of your consciousness. I'm like yeah, really right. now. Which uh. is really, I mean, being being a person, because I like to think, right? And I'm type A and all that. So I thought about that. <laughs> Thank right? you for and liking I'm a to dancer. think. Exactly. And I, I'm a dancer. I like to move. I like to do fancy things. I'm getting older. So I need to like really work on like keeping the body going and all that. And I realized that like I could do all of the fancy things. Mm. I have the skills. Like I could totally do it. I just don't work hard enough for it because it's not a priority, right? Mm -hmm. So in some ways, in order to be able, though there are some, tal some talented people out there that just have a talent, yeah, good for them, right? But for the majority of people, the, the discipline that it takes to maintain and support a practice of the kind that we see on Instagram, mm -hmm. right? I think it just makes you very, very inflexible in your consciousness actually and in your mind and very unable to accept change if you're aging or uh if you ate too much pizza last night you know yeah. um also yeah, like so. where's the breath in those photos you know like where is your capacity to breathe i mean you know that most of those pictures are taken you know uh they're posed without anyone warming up so there's actually a kind of you know i don't know there's a the, the culture of it to me seems, I mean, I don't know what all of them are doing and I'm not here to judge, but the culture of it seems to be that, you know, you take, you, you don't warm up. You're not actually doing a practice. You're just standing on a beach somewhere and doing a really fancy pose that may or may not be, you know, dangerous for you to do without having done, you know, I don't know, a few Surya Namaskars or something. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, I digress. So Anika, <laughs> Anika, do you have well, any thoughts on this, this topic? Yeah. You know, I do, and I think bringing it back to this idea of um, what is the impact and, and can this sometimes get in the way of, of larger issues that are affecting society, like spiritual by bypassing, like I think Margarita summed it up perfectly, but a lot of the things that I've personally seen as a black yogi in the yoga world mm -hmm. is this idea of um, that I am invisible. Um, and this sense of color blindness, which um, is unrealistic and um, degrading, that um, who I am as a person becomes ignored. Yeah. Um, and it's something that you see, um, and I'll get to the political piece in a, sec a second about how it gets in the way, but I think talking about even the physical, physical postures and how the bypassing and this idea of that, that yogis are colorblind, I, I think, frankly, is bullshit. Yeah. Um, because it, they're not, and I can't tell you how many times I've been in a class um, and studios that I don't go back to anymore, where like everybody was touched and given an assist but me. No. Um, and, yeah, yeah, and it's not a conscious thing, right? And this is yeah. the important thing to note. It's not like, oh, I'm not going to touch that person. But it's unknown because these are, you know, if, if you don't have a wide, you know, a, a wide group of, a, an inclusive group of friends, things that are unknown, you become afraid of. Yeah. Um, and it's those little subtle microaggressions that happen in yoga studios that people of color, marginalized groups, lesbian, gay, trans, queer, become, you notice them and you know that you are not welcome. Mm -hmm. Even though your yoga teacher is sitting up there in the middle of, you know, giving her Dharma talk about like, let's just be positive and be really happy. <laughs> um, but that, that doesn't include you. And it doesn't not include you, but it doesn't, there's no sense of being seen, and I think that that becomes really important. And you find that lots of people don't want to walk into a yoga studio because they don't feel like it's them for them. Yeah. And it goes back to that first question, can yoga be a form of activism? And that's why I think when you take this practice and put it someplace else and you take all of that stuff away, that it does become a form of activism. I think the other thing can I, that... Sorry, yeah. can I interject one thing? Because I... We're, sorry, Anika, but really, really important, I think, and I know you'll appreciate, but is that when... when You, you said that somebody that she was cutting me off, but so I'll appreciate it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you are a, a yogi that's already having that kind of experience, and on top of that, the yoga teacher that's in front of you is giving a Dharma talk that is about how the energy that you put out there is what comes back to you. Mm -hmm. Like that whole magical mm -hmm. thinking, law of attraction mm -hmm. thing. That's very, very common, right? Yep. Well, the, how does that make you feel? 
you right. know, if what you're feeling is that you're not being seen and that you are being oppressed again or that you're attracting more attention than you wish for some people or that, you, you know, it's like, how does that, how does it sit when you're having an experience that is a non-positive experience? Yeah. And, and it goes who was the back, teachers say that? Yeah, it goes back to this idea of truth. And that reinforces this idea of truth that may not be true about yourself, but you go to this space that you think is supposed to be warm and embracing and supporting you, and then you're not seen, and then you're told that the way that you're thinking is incorrect. It, it becomes, you know, damaging rather than this experience that's supposed to find, let, help you find this stronger sense of self or a stronger physical body or a way to feel safe. And I think that happens with, you know, the other thing that, like, makes me crazy is this idea of everybody overusing a hipsta. Like, you know, talking about nonviolence, nonviolence, non-harming, 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 which I think is code <laughs> for I'm not going to do anything. Yeah. I'm not going to take any action. I don't have to sort of speak up for anything because, you know, I'm all about ahimsa. And I think that is also very dangerous. Like, being nonviolent does not mean that you're passive, right? Like, yeah speaking up for someone or a group of people who are being oppressed or something's happening, that doesn't make you violent. It's just speaking a truth that's important to hear. So I think those things can be really alienating. Um, I, I remember I took a class the day after Philando Castile got shot, and I just needed a class because I was upset. And the teacher went into this whole thing about having, you know, all you need to do is reach for a more positive thought. Uh. And and, and I didn't have a more positive thought. Like, I was ready to, like, burn it all down because I was tired of seeing black men killed in the street. And so that wasn't where I was. And to, you know, I wasn't expecting anybody to talk about what was happening in the news, but to be told that all I needed to do was reach for something warm and fuzzy and I'd feel better, like, I was, I was enraged, just enraged. Mm -hmm. um, and so... I think those in those ways, epic, and it can become distracting. Yeah, I'm really happy that you said that about ahimsa because I actually feel like ahimsa becomes a scapegoat for people oh. who don't want to navigate in discomfort, and I mm -hmm. think like that's becoming an ongoing yeah. concern is that people just do not know how to be uncomfortable, and I'm mm -hmm. you know I'm talking more about like, just like be in pain in your pose or you know be in discomfort in your pose. It's like no you know, being able to like navigate that space of like you're saying profound, you know, rage and, and understanding the utility of that and not yeah. actually, and not kind of, you know, doing this weird kind of, um, uh, repression of anger as if, as if these emotions are somehow bad or evil, mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of this, it comes back to this, basically a, a morality, like a dualistic form of like good and bad forms of emotion rather than understanding like their worth and their value. Um, so I'm really glad you said that. Yeah. I'm going to add one more thing. Yes. And I'm taking it back to the body. Take it back. It's just because I, I was uh, back having to the a body, conversation. Margarita. But we're, it's the more, and I mean, I've been around like, you know, a lot of yoga studios in New York City and, and abroad and all over the place. And it's just kind of amazing to me how uh, the vast majority of classes are just not accessible to people that have injuries or mm -hmm. disabilities. And I'm not talking a wheelchair because that's, yeah. you know, we kind of goes without saying that that might require a little bit of extra attention, you know, yeah. but I've, I've found myself teaching in places where I have like a student without a leg, you know, or yeah. people, you know, that had, you know, some, severe limitations of movements and they're not young or they're like very very uncomfortable and is they're just not accessible and it's actually the the majority of my private clients are people that cannot go to a beginner's yoga class like they told me they tried they tried and they were just like I can't I can't follow it's not I'm not comfortable it's uh, it's not appropriate it hurts my body I don't understand like it does it's not enough time like whatever whatever it is the reasons you know and then these are the lucky people that can afford to hire me privately mm -hmm. you know yeah. but all the other ones that are out there that don't have that that privilege like we're just leaving them out right. or yoga even for bigger bodies which is something that we still yeah. continue to ignore 
um, yeah. and, and making, making a class really just for one kind of person. Like it's just one, one shape of person who's at a certain level of physical ability, um, who has a certain experience in the world as well. And our language, um, lots of times, you know, doesn't support that. It's not inclusive. So, um, so obviously we're talking, you know, a lot of the, the things that we're discussing are around, you know, issues of inclusion and diversity. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what kind of, um, uh, uh, what, what, what kind of things would you, would, do you see, sir, you know, this, we're talking about the future of the yoga teacher. So uh, in a future yoga studio, what kind of things would you say are implemented to start to cultivate a greater degree of inclusivity? Besides, you know, I, obviously we're talking a little bit about the teacher themselves need to be trained mm -hmm. in order to accommodate a variety of, yeah. uh, of bodies, but what other kinds of things are necessary? Uh, you know, I think even, yeah, beyond all of that stuff that we'd like to see, I, I think it's an unpacking of your own stuff, which you find coming up in lots of, you know, trainings that are geared around trauma or, or geared around resilience, but being able to do a deep dive into the, the various privileges that you may enjoy and not even realize um, because it's coming in contact with those that allows you to begin to see people as people and individuals rather than through your own experience. And I think that's what ends up happening. Teachers go to a TT and then they teach classes through a lens of their, their, own, their, own, life, uh, their own lives and without taking into consideration that people look different and have different experiences and, and, and rather than investigate that, it becomes, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to ignore that. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that should be a big part of the training. And, and it's not now. And I think yeah. in the world that we're living in, there are more conversations about people who, you know, I think about the trans conversations that are happening now, conversations about bigger bodies and body, posit and body positivity, conversations that are happening around mass incarceration, conversations that are having around groups of people who have been marginalized and ignored, and we are all one community. And I think when we can start to see that we're not just the neighborhood where you live in, you begin to set the stage for being a teacher that you don't necessarily have to change your language to be inclusive. Become, it becomes a part of your natural dialogue. Yeah. Wow. Really well said. Margarita, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Oh, just, I'm, I mean, I totally agree. Um, and I think that also once we are able to unpack our own stuff and teach from that place, mm -hmm. it makes the teacher a lot more vulnerable and it creates a much more horizontal yeah. um, setting in the class so that you, the teacher might not feel like they know everything and, or they have to know everything because they don't, because nobody knows everything. And I think that once us teacher will be better at making sure that we don't know everything and that that's okay, then people might be a little bit more um, prone to coming and asking the question. It would be like, hey, what do you think about this? Or do their own thing, right? Yeah. But as long as we present the teachings as truth revealed or, you know, this is the way that this pose has to be, this this or nothing or this is the full the what do they say the full expression of the right. pose like what does that mean the full expression for who like that's bullshit you know I, mean, I hate that yeah. you can come into the full expression of the pose what uh, I um <laughs> right but stuff like that where i feel like people don't feel like they're entitled to do what they want because we're keep we keep telling them that what they do is wrong yeah. because they're not doing it the way we want right yeah. And we're just not inviting personal exploration and we're not inviting self-discovery and we're not inviting, you know, spontaneous movement into yoga classes because things have to be done one way because that's the only way that we learned it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even when I was coming into, I mean, I have a couple thoughts on what you've said. And one is just like how shocking it is that there is so little require you know there's so little diversity training within yoga teacher trainings i mean there's just not i mean and, and i don't know i maybe this has changed but has there been has that been included in yoga alliance like requirements to to have that nope. kind of a component i mean it seems wild to me um and then also you know you're remarking about 
this kind of like presenting of the teachings as sort of absolute and and unwavering and and I feel like that really has changed and I celebrate that because I remember when I started teaching or when I started practicing like 13 years ago you know there was this attitude of like I am the teacher and mm -hmm. it was like aggressive you know and we've really I feel like especially in New York City the culture of mm -hmm. stu teachers has changed and it's more like teacher as friend rather than teacher as purported guru or whatever mm -hmm. and and so that to me seems to be a positive development yeah. toward kind of a humility and and an yeah. acknowledgement yeah. that we're all on this path we're all you know f you know beings who have our own shit to deal with and yeah. and 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 we should feel comfortable um saying when we don't know and when a t you know i have students ask me questions like about injuries i'm like i don't know that you should contact a doctor you know yeah. rather than rather than you know what used to be the case i feel like where a, a, a yoga teacher felt felt like they had to know everything and mm -hmm. so they would lie mm -hmm. when they didn't you know yeah or they would yeah. regurgitate and he, something that they heard in some class yeah somewhere. and it just restricts our range you know because I, I having been lucky enough to have studied a wide range of movement modality and not just mm -hmm. yoga right uh for my entire life like i can tell you for a fact that there is not one way to do a lunge and you can tell me that warrior one is that shape and so you should do it like that and i'll agree with that because you want to do that specific movement but you can't come and tell me that that's the only way to do it if you want to be safe or if mm -hmm. you want to have like all the benefits of the pose mm -hmm. because that's not true <laughs> right you know it's yeah. just it's just not true yeah. You can tell me this is where you, this is what it looks like. This is what the shape is for the sake of proprioception and proprioceptive ability and like learning, you know, to follow a structure, do it this way. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Fine. Yeah. But that's it. That's not that's not it. Do, it doesn't heal you if you do it that way more than if you do it a different way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well so. Said. OK, so. What else do we want to talk about here? Well, we have a few minutes before we want to open it up to questions. And I'll just repeat to everybody um, that, um, you know, if you have questions uh, based on what Onika and Margarita and I have been talking about, please go ahead and put them in the comments. And in a few minutes, we're going to turn to questions. But before we do that, um, uh, I wanted to ask um, what you think are, you know, the projects or the issues that, in your view, um, are the most kind of pressing for us. I mean, obviously we've been talking about this, but, um, mm -hmm. but are, are there specific kind of like, you know, political projects or, um, issues that, oh, that we're encountering right now that are, uh, that, are, that you see as kind of the most pressing to attend to? Onika? You go. <laughs> uh, okay. I'll go. I'll go. Um, you know, I think from a general perspective, something that's pressing, I think, is just access. Access to practices around breathing and mindful movement. Um, that is a, a really big deal, whether, you know, I teach, I teach in jails, but um, even in schools, you know, just allowing more people to understand and be, and have this shared with them. Um, you know, how many times um, have I taught a class inside a jail and, and People have never done yoga before, um, and that I think is is an important is probably one of the most pressing things. Um, I think for my own personal passion that I've been talking um, a lot about um, is a, a report that a New York the New York Times wrote an article um, in April um, about black mothers and low birth weights um, and black mothers. Um, and the lack of postnatal care that they were getting or not having great prenatal care. And the, the bottom line, the bot, just to bottom line it, that the issue is, used to be thought that it was access and black women didn't take care of themselves and all this other stuff. But a big part of what happens is this whole idea of their perception of how black women move through the world. So they don't feel pain the same way or they, you know, they get overlooked. And stress is also impacts the way that black mothers are carrying their babies. So this idea for me that yoga and mindfulness, meditation, pranayam is not just something nice to have, but it becomes a necessary tool for survival. Yeah. And that when I sit in the morning, um, it's not just because, you know, I'm a yoga teacher, but it's because 
I need some protective armor to go out into the world for all of the microaggressions that I, that I deal with and then even don't deal with because I'm so used to dealing with them. And I think that idea of being able to give these practices, and not just to black women, to people of color, to people who need them because of the way our, our systemic, we have systemic oppression in this world, we have to give people these tools. That's not even something, Margarita said it earlier, this is not something that we can keep anymore to ourselves. And it has to be shared as widely as, as widely as we can share it. Wow. Wow, you've got some and good you've got some good sound bites here, Onika. We're gonna have to like <laughs> we're gonna have to edit those out and just like, you know make little Twitter. promos. Yeah, little promos. <laughs> um I think I'm gonna add to that, which is somewhat related and it relates back to one of the problems that we get into um, in teaching yoga um, is training, is training, educating and training people that are not like me and you, Jacob, maybe yeah. more like Onika, exactly. but <laughs> mm -hmm. not really like, anyway, yeah. uh, training these people that we go and teach to and share our practices with, right? If we could also train them to be themselves teachers or leaders, like right? give them enough consistent um access so that they can then become leaders and teachers in their own community will make it so that we don't keep seeing as I see all the time you know the white lady yoga teacher coming and trying to save all of these mm -hmm. poor people mm -hmm. because that paradigm also as much as I'm, I'm one of them so whatever I suck it up um, <laughs> but I teach in jails I teach in in even in, in the rehab I teach at like it's largely largely brown and black people mm -hmm. and Hispanics and you know mm -hmm. and it's it's like it can't just be me you know mm -hmm. it can't just be the white yoga teachers trying because then you get the savior complex which is mm -hmm. a major issue with people that try to do um, yoga and activism type mm -hmm. things and work in, in certain environment like you can't go in trying to save people you can just go in trying to give people access and share what you have mm -hmm. um, but if we could train them so that they could go back to their community and teach in their own way and in their own languages and in their own cultural context. Um, I think that would be a big revolution. Yeah, I mean, I feel, I'm so glad you said that because another thing that, that sort of came to my mind as um, when we were talking about the, um, the issues of, of, you know, yoga studio spaces with, or the tra teacher trainings is that not only is there, mm -hmm. you know, not teacher training around um, it just a, a variety of bodies and inclusivity, but there's also not training around, you know, possible alternative contexts than the kind of modern, you know, fitness focused yoga studio, yeah. which as we've been saying is an inherently privileged space, right? right. It's <laughs> very white and it's, um, and so, you know, to even train people to think differently about mm -hmm. the ways mm -hmm. in which yoga can be housed and, and mm -hmm. that's why it's so, you know, why it's so amazing. And this is sort of segueing now into um, uh, um, the my kind of final question for you, both of you, which is, you know, let's let's talk about the work that you do mm -hmm. and let's talk about these alternative spaces that you're working in and, and the ways in which you are prying open, um, the, you know, this idea of the appropriate yoga context. So, um, Margarita, do you want to start and tell us a little bit about um, your work? Sure. So uh, I've been teaching with Onika and Liberation Prison Yoga for a few years, both at Rikers Island and now I'm also teaching at Manhattan Detention Complex. Um, and uh, that is probably the, the most extreme environment, if you wish, right? Mm. Um, where you just... You know all the all the good things about the yoga studio where you go in and it's peaceful and there's like soothing music and it smells like patchouli. Well, if you're lucky, like something else. Um, <laughs> and it's clean and there's blankets and bolsters and you know everybody's quiet and tiptoeing around and checking their phones because you can't get off. Um, you go to prison and you just teach in the dorm and some people will be taking class and some people will not and guards come in and go out and people yell and throw banana peels sometimes if they get upset. Um, or yell at each other or get in a fight or your students will get called to clinic or they'll get called to rec or they'll get called to commissary or 
and you just you just kind of go with the flow you know and in a way it's like that that part of the practices that allows us to kind of create a little bit of a, a separation between ourselves and the world which if you take it to an extreme is obviously problematic that's a kind of transcendence or, or separation idea it has a value too if you're in a place like that and if it's very chaotic and you have no control over it and it's really like hard to relax and focus you want to create that skill right um I mean, if you can meditate in jail, you can probably go meditate anywhere. Right. Yeah, it would be right. just amazing, mm-hmm. you know. Um, the rehab I teach at is similar. It's similar to people. It's an alternative to incarceration program. So I've, I've met people at Rikers and then found them again at the rehab after they were sentenced. Um, but we usually do the classes in, in a room, right? So at least we have the privacy, generally speaking, mm-hmm. or in a gym or something like that. Uh, so the setting is a little, it's still not a yoga studio, but it's definitely a little bit more contained and a little bit more uh, peaceful, but still people come and go and, um, and they, and they talk a lot like that whole yoga studio. Nobody talks and they do what they're told. Yeah, that doesn't happen. It's like, everybody's like, beep, 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 beep. Oh, it feels like this. Oh, you know, if you've ever asked like a yoga class in a studio, like, it, you know, is, is, is this okay? Is it clear? Is, is what I'm saying clear? And everybody's yeah. just like silent i'm like you yeah. guys like uh, do you like am i making sense <laughs> in jail it's not like that they'll be like ah da, 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 this makes sense this doesn't i don't know this i don't like i'm gonna try this other thing and i get and then they tell you the story of their life and it's like <laughs> i think that part of a uh, part of yoga should be our ability to hold others and and hold and be in relationship with others um, and if we work on centering ourselves enough, right, if we have that block, then we can do that, mm-hmm. right? Um, and that's just so important relating to what Onika was saying about, like, the experience of not being seen or not being heard, right? Yeah. Um, so that's a huge chunk of the work that we do. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, the pearls that come out, like, I can't even start. It's, like, amazing. Mm-hmm. Well, and also, like, and I, I love that like they feel comfortable being chatty and open. I mean, it seems like it mm-hmm. probably like helps to foster a kind of relationship with students that you wouldn't otherwise have. You know, I mean, I have a hard yeah. time getting students to say good morning when I walk into a class and I'm like, good morning. Mm-hmm. And it's just literally crickets. Nobody mm-hmm. speaks. Like, yeah. Let me ask mm-hmm. that. Or let me say that again. Mm-hmm. I know. Uh, yeah, it's such a it's such a strange kind of cultural you know thing that we like mm-hmm. feel feel that it must be silent at all times. Mm-hmm. Um, so Onika, I mean, I know you two do similar work, but what is um, one? Will you talk a little bit about the work that you do? Yeah, um, I think you know, Margarita summed up a lot of the work that we do in teaching in a chaotic environment. But one of the things that I think is also important about this work goes to just the fact that you show up and you look somebody in the eye, and you're not giving them an order or telling them that, you know, they're supposed to be somewhere, but you're just, that you are there for them, Um, and to share with them, whether it's a class, a meditation, a conversation, um, or just to listen, that becomes, I think, I I don't want to say a bigger part of the work, but it it is just as important, Um, Mm -hmm. and there's this sense that you aren't, like, I'm not the, like, I'm a teacher, right, and I'm there teaching class, Um, but there is a community that I think gets created when we teach our classes that people look forward to, Um, and even for the people who aren't taking class, there is a sense of community, even people who probably make fun of us when we come in and, and do this work that there is a sense of community. And I think for me, the biggest thing that I have learned from doing this work um, and showing up to jail week after week is that the people that I work with um, are my community. Um, And just because they're over there, I'm over there with them. And I think that's the thing that's the, the most important thing for me that I've learned, that just because somebody is away doesn't mean they're no longer a member of community. And that's the way that we think of people who are in jail or in prison. And by going in and looking somebody in the eye and saying, I see you, um, like literally I am bowing to you and I see you, um, that can create a really big shift for people to begin to see themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's 
I think the the most important part of the work that I do. Um, with all of, and doing that with all of the components that Margarita was talking about, with the noise and all of the things that we deal with, and and you know a big part of the work is actually just getting there and getting inside, and it's a lot of hurry. Oh no, I lost. Uh, we lost Onika's feed. Um, but, but I'm uh, still here. You're so but lucky. But Margarita's still here. Uh, Margarita, <laughs> do you want to finish Onika's sentence? <laughs> I I will finish the sentence. Um, uh, oh man, I was uh, I couldn't finish the sentence, but I was uh, thinking about adding something else. Hi, oh, there she is. She's back. back. Okay, you want to finish your she sentence, Onika? Um, I I was saying hurry up and wait, and then. Um, I don't remember what I was going to say, but I did want to say too that the other organization that I work with, um, actually to Margarita's point earlier, um, has completed like their third yoga teacher training inside a prison, um, and that becomes that idea of peers teaching each other and expanding the practice. So we aren't just people who go in and do stuff and leave, and we become the connection to the yoga, right? Like ideally you know, we are giving people a practice that they can do on their own so the teacher becomes unnecessary to some degree. Yeah. So, you know, guys who become yoga teachers teach classes. And, you know, a, a prison actually, you know, this gets to be the job that they do. They get to teach yoga um, and, you know, even have continuing education classes um, and be registered yoga teachers. Like, I think that is... Um, that's some amazing work that that takes place too that I get mm -hmm. to be a part of. That mm, I think is amazing. Awesome. Yeah. Wow, this has been such a amazing conversation and um, and so important. So thank you so much for for chatting to me. Um, <laughs> and it's not over. Now we're going to chat with the people who are with us. So those of you who are watching right now, there is a little bit of a, a lag time, um, you know. So I'll, I'll I'll sort of stall. But there are a couple questions here that we can um, attend to. But if you have a question. Um, <clears throat> please, you know, share it and, and I'll ask it to uh, Margarita and Onika and, and we'll see what they have to say. So um, I have, okay, is this discussion going to be available to watch later? Yes, Sandra, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, that one's not really a question, so I'm just going to pass that one. Um, oh, this is, a, this is a good one. So opening access in jails, schools, hospitals, old age homes, etc. Even if they let us in, the institutions are resistant to monetizing it. What's a teacher who needs some cash flow to do? <laughs> so the question oh. being, you know, like, is it even a privilege to be able to... Of course like, it is. Yeah. Of course it yeah. is a privilege. I get paid in rehab, for example. Okay. And sometimes mm -hmm. we get paid in prison too. Like it takes, it might take more work to convince them to give you the money but mm -hmm. it's also yoga teachers are very cheap like a, a yoga class a week for a, an institution costs nothing yeah right however you can also see it as like a, you know can you teach a private so that then you can teach one class for free in a place where they can't pay you right you know what i mean it's I like can we i'm all for charging the people that have the money so that i don't have to charge the people that don't have the money right so I do work with an organization that actually does pay all of its teachers. So um, I would do some research on organizations that are doing this work that you can partner with. It is really challenging to go inside by yourself to get this work done mm -hmm. um, unless you have a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. And if this is something that you're really passionate about doing and you want to set up a nonprofit because this is work that you're committed to doing, um, like long term, then I say that that's a suggestion that you do. That's that's something to do as well. And it's not. And, and your approach is everything, right? Yoga teachers can have to the outside world, right? Have this, I you know, there's this idea that we're sort of like flaky and airy. And so, if you want to do this work, like show up meaningfully, have a proposal, talk about the benefits, really let these places know that there are reasons why they should be paying for this and the benefits that are in it for the institution that you're talking to. Um, a lot of facilities really understand what's in it for them, right? You know, even though they're serving people. So that how it reduces stress, it takes pressure off. Even offering a class like, pay me for these two classes and that I'll do a class for your staff for free. You know, there are ways around this and you have to get creative. Um, but do some homework, um, and, and it can be done. I'm not saying it's easy, but, but there are ways to do it. Yeah, that's really good advice. Um, 
Is there any other, I mean, just on that kind of question of, mm -hmm. of advice for people who are actually interested in getting involved but don't really see how to do that, you know, based on, um, you know, financial or access or whatever. Is there mm -hmm. anything else um, besides this kind of more, you know, how to pitch to an organization, mm -hmm. um, suggestions that you would offer to people who are interested in getting involved? I would take a training with the kind of work that you're interested in getting involved with too because that also creates a network of people that you can talk to who may be doing this work. Right. Knowing people is also everything when it, you know, when you're trying to get a foot in the door. Um, so that's, that's also some advice that I would give. Okay. Mm -hmm. What about you, Margarita? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I think that's it. I mean, ideally, the, the thing that, one of the reasons, which it's a whole problem in itself, but I think that one of the reasons why people find it so hard to start doing this work is because a lot of the people like me don't know the people that they would want to teach. So you don't have a way in, like you can't just go to your buddy that lives, uh, you know, in the projects in the Bronx and be like, hey, yo, I want to do a yoga class because you don't know any. They might want to do it, but you don't know any and you don't know how to get in, right? And that's a, it's a whole problem in itself, right? Mm. So one way to bypass it is to find a community of teachers that do that kind of work, right? right? There are a lot of places that are offering those kind of things and it's, fairly easy with the internet to find even just the names of the teachers and just go stalk the teachers down be like hey how did you get in do you need anybody like I got my job at the rehab because a common friend actually left it mm -hmm. and she mm -hmm. knew that I like to do this kind of work and she was like hey I'm moving do you want to do it you know um so it's it's possible again it might take a little bit more homework if you don't have you know a any direct access to places like this but you can also walk into a shelter and offer a free class you can walk into yeah. hospitals not so easy but places like shelters or uh, even some schools though they might do background checks afterwards and so on and so forth but like charter schools are a little bit easier to get in that regular mm -hmm. school um, like there there are there are ways you know community centers like mm -hmm. community centers you mm -hmm. know yeah. or galleries or I mean bars I know tons of people that teach classes in the back of the bar, you know, mm -hmm. if they have a space. Or you mm -hmm. start there and then you see, but like that way you start meeting the people and all of that mm -hmm. stuff. So here's a comment that sort of leads, I think, into a question. Um, I feel the word yoga itself, this is Molly Jorgensen. Hi, Molly. I feel the word yoga itself is becoming problematic and stereotyped. As a yoga teacher, I've been using the language movement or somatic practice mm -hmm. when promoting my classes. So is there any, um, you know, what's the incentive to use the word yoga if we can just use, this is my interpretation of the question, um, you know, what's the incentive to use the word yoga if we're, if, if it's, you know, if we could just use somatic, um, I don't know, somatic attention or something? Well, are you just teaching somatic movement? First of all, somatic movement is a copyright, so I wouldn't necessarily use that. Or somatics. Uh, <laughs> somatics is a copyright. Somatic Everything's movement a copyright, not, Margarita. Like, yeah, what are you gonna I mean, do? <laughs> exactly. But just to say, like, there are brands for that stuff, too. Like, you, you know, you also have to consider, like, somatic movement is a specific thing. Yeah. You know, are you doing that thing? Or are you doing yoga asana? Right. Yeah. Because if you're doing yoga asana and using that kind of framework, then you should use that kind of framework. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even if you're just teaching asana, even if you're just teaching the movement and you're not teaching any of the other stuff that yoga should incorporate, which is kind of what we were talking about. It's like to me, yeah. in some ways, it's like you can teach the asana. And if you want to get into activism, then you need to do the other stuff, too. Right. right? And yeah. then I call it yoga because right. the framework becomes what makes it yoga. Right. I think that if you're teaching sun salutations and warrior one and two and three and, and uh, Ardha Matsindrasana and so on and so forth, you should call it yoga because that's a tradition that yeah. it's for. Right, because if you're you know? not, it's sort of like uh, opening up questions about cultural appropriation and not, exactly. about, and, and not honoring the lineage that yeah. this comes from. And, yeah. And, yeah. and also yeah. people, you know, should, you know, you should advertise your classes, which may be what is it, Molly? Maybe she's doing it. You know, maybe you're doing it. I'm not saying that that's not what's happening. I don't know what she's teaching, right? Um, but I think that it's important that we give our classes a title that reflects what we're teaching. Yeah. You know, I don't teach a ballet class or don't call my ballet class a yoga class and my yoga <laughs> class a ballet class just because I want mm -hmm. to, because I want to attract those people. But it's the same thing, 
You know, I don't call my modern dance class a contemporary dance class, which for 90% of the people out there will make no difference. Yeah. But for dancers will. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. Good answer. Anika, do you have any thoughts on that? On that? No, I echo everything that Margarita is saying. I think representation matters and you need to be very careful when it comes to this idea of appropriation and asking mm -hmm. yourself, well, why do I want to take the term yoga out, right? Like, that's a good question to ask because the truth is, if you aren't doing something, if you are sort of stretching and not doing asana, then, yeah, it's probably not yoga. But if there's something that you're trying to skirt around to make it more comfortable or accessible, um, properly acknowledging lineage, I think, is necessary. Yeah. So now, I mean, this is really great into the, this next question. Um, so and I'm, thank you, Jonathan, for asking it, because I think it actually, because one key, like, uh, I, you know, key aspect, I think, of cultural appropriation is, is anesthetizing yoga of its spiritual aspect, right? Mm -hmm. Because yoga was historically a spiritual practice, and there's no getting around that. So Jonathan asks, hi, all, enjoying the discussion so far. Much of what you've discussed so far seems to relate primarily to yoga as healing which is clearly where there is huge need at present. I'm interested to hear how you relate this back to your personal journey slash pursuit of the, quote, true goal of yoga, i.e. spiritual liberation. Okay. Sorry, I'm just going to say one thing. Okay. If you... I don't ascribe to the fact that my goal is liberation. Let's start there, right? Mm -hmm. I think that it's important that we clarify what the that is that 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 is the goal of yoga in some, not all traditions, fair. Right. Um, what liberation? What do you mean by liberation? I guess maybe it's more that. Like, what do you mean by liberation? Is a big issue, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that also what you mean by healing is a big conversation um, and I think that for myself and it took me a long time I've been practicing for a very very long time like 20 some years but um, there are different ways of practicing and it took me a long time to come to this place where I'm now and for many years I really enjoyed that kind of very rigid, uh, regimented, structured teaching uh, because I like that. I like taking orders. I was really good at it. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't particularly appreciate making choices because then it meant that I had to be invested in mm -hmm. something and put my opinion out there. And I think that a lot of people, because we're trained like that, we're trained to follow orders, to do what we're told, to listen, uh, to try to be better. Like that's that's what they teach us since we're little children you know you go to school you go to kindergarten and they're like just listen and shut up yeah you know otherwise you're like misbehaving right so that stuff stays with us right and part of the process is just defining your liberation you know the liberation for me was getting breaking free from those structures and and understanding the importance and the strong strength that it gave me to make my own choices in movement and in meditation and in breath work and taking what I wanted from the teachers whom I deeply, deeply respect and honoring the lineages that I come from or acknowledging them because that's fair, right? But also acknowledging that freedom. So to me, again, once we will, once for me, once I'll be free of all of those conditioning, then I'll consider myself free, right? And, and that, maybe that's, that's the liberation that we're looking for. Right. Some I mean, us. you could make this. I mean, it's really a, I really think it's almost it's just like about how you package it almost because you could say that once those once those scales have been lifted, you will mm -hmm. be, you know, you will experience a yeah. kind of seamlessness with reality that the traditions mm -hmm. are talking about. Mm -hmm. I know, Margarita, this is reminding me of our conversation at Rebecca's house where we had a conversation <laughs> about God and I'm still working on her. 
to get her to recreate the idea of God in a different way. But we'll leave that for the, spir for the spiritual discussion in a few weeks. Our, our God situation is just not the same, not on the same wave. <laughs> it will be. Don't worry. We're all going to end up in the same place anyway. So, Anika, do you have any thoughts on that? On uh, on that? On what? Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry. What was his name? Jonathan? Yeah, Jonathan said. Yeah, I also think the word liberation is really tricky, too. Um, I think my practice has shifted so much. Um, what I'm looking for now are ways to continually find myself unhooking from messaging that um, I deal with daily to find spaces for myself to love myself deeply, to make a deeper connection with the community around me. Um, and I think that has been, it's ongoing, there are days I am better at it than others. Um, but I think for so long, even when I first started practicing, I was connected to this external idea of self. Um, and it was always in relationship to something else. And, and even in yoga, it was that for a long time. It was relationship to a pose, even relationship to the study itself. It was always this outside, I was always trying to get to this goal and look at even yoga from this outside perspective. And I think for me, it's when I really started to shift to a more, um, a, a practice that embraced metta and loving kindness that I started to realize like, oh, it starts here, right? And then by looking inside for me, that's where my practice has been, I think, lately for the past few years. How can I unhook from the outside messages and, and, and really focus on what's happening in here because this is where this is where my identity starts and it's not this it's not this sort of um, idea of spiritual individualism where I, it all ends and begins with me and that's not what I'm talking about. Yeah. I still deeply believe in interdependence yeah. um, but by starting here and loving myself, I have an ability to be more open. Um, to the outside world, even to aspects of the world that may actively reject my presence. Yeah, beautiful. So this is sort of a related question. Um, uh, Car Kalia? Sorry, Kalia, if I mispronounce that. Kalia Marshall says, thank you so much for this discussion. I'm wondering if how you both acknowledge the roots and lineage of yoga in your classes. Is this something that is important for you to clearly introduce to your students? This is, you know, this is something I struggle with, with this form of trauma and form yoga, where there is this um, idea of not wanting to necessarily acknowledge the roots and lineage of yoga, and I struggle with it. Um, and I do connect with the roots and classes that I teach outside of jail, but it is not something that we ascribe to with other organizations that I work with. I think there have been times at you know, in classes when I've been working with people, especially at Rikers, over time that this just becomes a natural part of the conversation as you start to work with people more and more, you start to have these kinds of conversations. But um, I struggle a lot with the idea of making sure that am I appropriating and, and how can I keep checking myself about that? Mm -hmm. Good answer. What about you, Margarita? Um, well, I don't, I don't think, first of all, I don't think I teach through a direct lineage. Mm -hmm. um, I have trained in many places that are vastly different and come from different lineages, right? So there's that problem. Like, I, I usually say, like, I've learned this thing from this person or I learned mm -hmm. that thing for that person, you know, or, or I'll acknowledge things like that as I'm teaching, but I necessarily feel the need to list my lineage because I don't have one. Mm -hmm. um, if I was going to take it into a wider context of lineage and because I teach vinyasa yoga, you go all the way back to Krishnamacharya, then it becomes highly problematic because a lot of the stuff, you know, is the bad stuff that came down to the Sorry, Margarita, of... you broke up just a little bit there. Can you repeat what Oops. you just said? Yes that if I take the lineage and trace it back, the lineage of vinyasa yoga, let's say, if I teach vinyasa yoga and I take it all the way back to the lineage to the beginning, which we can say is probably Krishnamacharya in terms of like what we teach now, right? And when it was codified, together with all the good things that we got from, from those, you know, first two, three people in the lineage, we got a lot of bad stuff too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
And so sometimes I mention that too, and I think that it's important yeah. um, in, in the acknowledging of the lineage and the teachers in order to create a more horizontal um, classroom that we see as students that we call out the wrongdoings and the and the the poor decisions which can be given by a number of factors and we're not going to get into that discussion now, mm -hmm. now but whatever but that we see that right and that as teachers we acknowledge that as well and we hold our teachers to the highest standard i don't i've never had a guru i've never had a, a direct um sort of transmission like that mm -hmm. i had a lot of very good teachers and i certainly yeah, acknowledge them when the occasion comes, but I don't know that it's all that useful to the people that I work with, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. or to this, it's just there to be, to make me feel or to, like they're more legit. That's not a good enough reason. Right. Yeah. So, um, I don't know how, um, uh, well, I'll ask this question and see uh, if you have any thoughts on it. It's from Maggie Gruskin, um, and I think this is probably one of our, our last questions. So, do you guys view the International Day of Yoga as a form of activism? The Prime Minister Modi is a huge supporter of yoga, but I'm seeing so much focusing on standardizing the yoga protocol and perhaps exporting some Hindu emphasis to the global celebration. Any thoughts? I mean, I think this is sort of you know, I don't, if you guys know much about the Hindutva movement and this sort of like fundamentalist kind of gesture around, right. you know, yoga, which is complicated. It's such a complicated topic. But do either of you have any thoughts on that? It's a more complicated topic than I have a lot of knowledge on, but I have heard that there are issues with it. It's not something that I um, celebrate, you know, using air quotes or, um, <laughs> <laughs> or even acknowledge, to be honest with yeah. you. I've never celebrated it. <laughs> I mean, if you go back to what we said at the beginning, activism was, right? For both me and Onika, there was a component of making a stance for something that you believe in and possibly sharing something to people that usually don't have access to it. And I just don't think that International Yoga Day is doing any of that. Yeah. So just because of that, I can say I don't consider it as a form of activism. Mic drop. I think it's a commercial <laughs> thing. <laughs> Mic drop again. Gosh, you had so many mic drops. Dude, Maria. you were killing it. Are we back? Yeah, we were taking we over. We were taking over. Oh, you were. Okay. So, okay, it says that we're back online, so let's just hope that that's true. Um, okay. <laughs> so do you have any final thoughts you want to share um, with our lovely, um, uh, the lovely audience that we have today? I'm... I'm really grateful to be able to have this conversation um, and to have people give really thoughtful questions about this work. Um, I think over the next three or four years, activism is going to explode even more than it has. And I, I'm grateful that teachers are being thoughtful or yogis are being thoughtful about their approach to activism. Um, and, and hopefully this has helped give some I don't know, shed some light, at least some of what, what I think it is um, and what it's done for me. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you have any closing thoughts, Margarita? I think also that it's amazing that we are having this conversation um, and that there are more and more people that are willing to have it. And I would just encourage everyone to do the homework, read mm -hmm. read read the articles, read the books, do the things, and read the sad stuff, read the sob stories, read the, the painful, hard-to-read stories, like look into all of those things because it's part of uh, what we carry and our ability as yoga teachers to hold them mm -hmm. is what makes this practice relevant. Beautiful. So... Well, thank you so much, um, Margarita Tassado and thank Anika you. Mayes, for joining me for this really um, fascinating and important conversation around thank the intersection you. of yoga and activism. Um, we're going to be back next week with the intersection of yoga, teaching, and healing, or what it even means to say that one is a healer. So um, should uh, complement this conversation quite nicely. 
So, um, and just one last time, I want to mention that next Thursday, for those of you who are interested, um, we have a talk happening with Isu Guchardi as a part of the Yoga Teacher Advanced Studies Seminar. And if you're interested in registering for that talk, which is called Depth Hypnosis, Perspectives on Trauma for Yoga Teachers, um, Isa has developed a really interesting um, trauma-based therapy that uh, integrates a number of different modalities. So she's going to be talking about um, that modality in relation to teaching yoga and how we might integrate those insights into our teaching practice. And that's July 19th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, East Coast U.S. And uh, if you want to sign up for that, you just head to embodiedphilosophy.com forward slash yoga seminar which I'm gonna set that link up right after I get off this call. Or if you're trying to find it right now, you'll find it at embodiedphilosophy.org forward slash P forward slash Y-T-A-S-S. All right, so again, thanks so much, Onika and Margarita. It's been Thank a you. Thank you. All right. <laughs>